we're going to zig yet again. We're going to talk about the Democratic debates a week after they happened. You're listening to Right to Life Radio on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400. We're zagging. We're zagging while others zig. Yeah. See, the real zig... See, last week, we zagged by not talking about the Democrat debates. This week, we're zagging by talking about them a week late. This is just this is just how I do. I'm just a rebel. You can't tie me down. John Girardi here on Right to Life Radio, a production, as always, of Right to Life of Central California, rtlcc.org. You can follow me on Twitter, at Fresno Johnny. That's at Fresno Johnny. Hey, that is so much easier to remember than your previous. Twitter I know. Handle. At John V. Girardi was my old one. Try spelling Girardi. Try remembering that V. Joining me, as always, uh, the dulcet tones of Mr. Jonathan Keller, the CEO of California Family Council. Jonathan, how's it going? It's it's going pretty good, all things considered. Uh, obviously, uh, I, I realize this is a, a week late, but obligatory uh, thoughts and prayers for the families of Dayton, Ohio, and yes. uh, El Paso, Texas. Yes, um, just and we're, we, we may talk about that a little bit later on the show, um, maybe in a way that'll make me incredibly unpopular. Who knows? <laughs> Um, I'm just going to wade into some dangerous water. Okay. We're going to start off by talking a little bit about last week's Democratic debates. This is like a week and a half ago now, but this is the way I like doing political analysis is um, waiting like a week and a half. Now, you may be thinking, that's ridiculous. How could you? It's, it's, it's old news. Well, t- giving things time to settle, I find, is useful in a lot of political thought. Uh, it may not have mattered very much in the course of this debate, but I think it's I, I think it's it's my general policy. Um, uh, people who didn't wait a week for, let's say, I don't know, the kids from Covington who wore those hats and sort of made a slightly unfortunate looking smirk at a strange Native American man who was beating a drum in their face. The people who didn't wait a week and a half looked like real big idiots. So I'm just making it my policy. I like to wait things out unless they immediately demand some kind of response. The Democratic debates are not that important. They don't demand an immediate response. So, also, the show only records, like, once a week. So, like, it's kind of difficult to always, you know, uh, predict what's hot. So, let's talk about the Democratic debates. Abortion was brought up a little bit in the second debate. So, the debates go over two nights. The first night, nobody talked about abortion at all. Which is shocking, John, because I thought it was an existential crisis that Trump and the Republicans were forcing women to back alleys and you're seeing this extremist rise of new laws. Yeah, anyway. I guess not important enough to ask Pete Buttigieg what he thinks about it. So, in the second night of the debate, uh, the second night of the debate, which I think was, they didn't intend it that way, but it kind of, I feel like, sort of, kind of wound up feeling like the big kid's table because Kamala Harris and uh, Joe Biden were there. So, and by the way, the the idea that that was a random draw by CNN... (laughs) please. (laughs) It was not a random draw. Harris versus Biden was the big story from the last debate. They wanted to make it again the big story in this debate. The idea that that was randomly selected, I believe, is nonsense. It's a TV show. The point of the TV show is for people to watch it so they can sell advertisements. All right. So Kamala Kamala Harris and Joe Biden got into a little spit spat about Biden's stance on the Hyde Amendment. Now, you listen to this show regularly now on at its new time from 9 to 10 a.m. here on Power Talk. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, and available in a podcast. Just find it on Apple Podcasts, Right to Life Radio. As regular listeners to this show know, the Hyde Amendment is this rider. It gets attached to the federal budget every single year. It's going to get attached to the federal budget this year. And it prevents federal dollars in federal health care programs, chiefly Medicaid programs, from being used to directly pay for abortions, to directly reimburse health care providers who are doing abortions, with the exceptions of rape and incest. We have talked about Joe Biden and the very significant policy shift that he made. So let's track Joe Biden's uh, varied and twisting positions on the question of abortion. Joe Biden was first elected to the Senate in the 70s. And when he was initially elected, he was in, he's a senator from Delaware, Delaware, which is very close to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has, has very strong, a very strong presence of pro-life Democrats in it. So there are lots of Pennsylvania, Delaware crossover. Joe Biden was elected as a pro-life Democrat. He was allegedly against abortion in the 70s. 
1988, Joe Biden changes his position on abortion. He is now in favor of abortion, but he is in favor of the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment, that rider to the federal budget that prevents federal funding from paying for abortion. So he's in favor of the Hyde Amendment. And this is basically Biden's position for the next 30 years. I was born in 1987. Joe Biden adopted this position in 1988. So this is a position that's older than my wife, younger than me. So from 1988 to 2019, Joe Biden maintained this position. I am in favor of legalized abortion. I am not in favor of the federal government paying for it. That was his position. Which, to those of us that are pro-life, is still a bad position, to be clear. It is an inadequate position. But but at least... At it's better, minimum, than, better than being in favor of the government paying for it. Yeah. It is not directly... It, it's not the absolute worst possible position. It's a, it's a quasi-libertarian position, which I, 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 we have some friends that call themselves libertarians that say, hey, I don't personally like abortion, but, but I think the government should stay out of it. As long as the government's not paying for it, you know, what adults do, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Now, now, we could de- deconstruct that argument, John, but the, but the main thing was it was... It, that's even a dumb argument from a libertarian position, <laughs> I'd, I'd say, and I'm no libertarian, but anyway. But, it, but at least Joe Biden had that quasi reasonable position yes go i mean and it's the same type quasi, of quasi semi sort of at least within the democratic party it was considered to be moderate it was yeah. middle of the road it was not as pro-life as someone like the former governor of pennsylvania uh, bob casey senior mm-hmm. not as pro-life as someone like dan lipinski or zell miller you know any of these I don't know about what zell miller's position was on abortion but he was pretty conservative anyway. no he was yeah he was pro-life yeah, okay anyway Joe Biden from 1988 to 2019 says, I support the Hyde Amendment. In one week, in when was that when he flip flop? I think that was like May of 2019. Yeah, April yeah. or May. Just yeah. very recent. Within a single week in May of 2019, he said, Oh, that Hyde Amendment has to go. Because Joe Biden's really old and he gets things confused. <laughs> he didn't understand what the Hyde Amendment was. And so he said to someone, Oh, yeah, that Hyde Amendment's got to go. Then he had a bunch of surrogates come on TV and say, no, 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 no. Joe Biden supports the Hyde Amendment. He supports the Hyde Amendment because of his deep religious convictions. This is what one of his surrogates said, like one of his campaign flunkies came on CNN and said, no, no, no. Joe Biden supports the Hyde Amendment because of his deep religious beliefs, his deep religious values as regards abortion. And that's why, look, Democrats, you can be mad at me, but if you are, subtly, you are being a religious bigot and... uh, Against uh, Joe Biden from three months ago, as opposed to Joe Biden now. The day after that, he had his campaign surrogates and flunkies go on TV to say, oh, Joe Biden supports the Hyde Amendment because of his deep religious convictions. It appears Joe Biden obtained new religious convictions (laughs) and switched his position to saying, no, now I oppose the Hyde Amendment. Uh, So he went from supporting the Hyde Amendment for 30 years, opposing it, supporting it again, and now he opposes it. So now he does believe that the federal government and federal health care programs should pay for any abortion, whether any legal abortion. That's what he believes. Now, this is um, this is obviously troubling. Kamala Harris during the debate. Well, it's troubling from my perspective because he's now supporting having my taxpayer dollars pay for abortion. It was troubling from Kamala Harris, our illustrious California senator. It was troubling from her position because she said, hey, you're flip-flopping all over the place. How can we really trust you to be truly in favor of women's choice? And Biden then proceeded to give a rambling, bizarre answer that I don't think Harris really called him out on, saying, well, now that the federal government pays for everyone's health care, which it doesn't, or every poor person's health care, which it doesn't, uh, now that that's the case, now we need to get rid of the Hyde Amendment so that all these poor people who have government-funded health care uh, can get abortions. All right, that seems to be his rationale for flip-flopping. And Harris kind of let it go, but the, the thing that seems... Th- that this debate is really... It's not so much the death knell of safe, legal, rare, but it's really like putting the final shovels of dirt on the grave of the Democrat Party of safe, legal, and rare abortion. What do I mean by that? All right. The terminology around abortion and the terminology around abortion within the Democratic Party, within the Democratic Party platform, and among Democrat politicians and candidates, particularly candidates for the presidency and other high offices, has changed dramatically since 
poor old 1988 Joe Biden was voting for the Hyde Amendment. The language in the 90s, in the Clinton era, which was language that Joe Biden sort of agreed with and ran with and represented, was that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. This jived well with Democrat politicians who supported the Hyde Amendment, saying, okay, well, we think abortion should be legal. We don't need to force all the taxpayers to pay for it, though. It's a necessary evil. Necessary evil, yes. I would personally never have an abortion. Well, Joe, you, Joe Biden frequently said that, Joe. Personally, you would never get pregnant. Uh, but ju- there was all of these uh, politicians that, while I am personally opposed to abortion, nevertheless, I think it's totally fine to make, uh, you know, nevertheless, I think it's fine to have it be legal. That has died in the last 10 years. Now, no one is in favor of safe, legal, rare abortion. They are in favor of abortion being safe, legal, and universally accessible. 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 This is the key word of the pro-choice left, and accessibility means if there's any barrier to me getting an abortion, whether that be lack of money, whether that be the moral qualms of healthcare providers, all of those things should be leveled. And thus, the Hyde Amendment is not consistent with that viewpoint. What is necessary is fully federally funded abortion, and that is what is being demanded of Joe Biden and the Democrats. All right. We're going to talk about some crazy perspectives from the New England Journal of Medicine about population explosion and maybe a little commentary on the recent news about the shootings. You're listening to Right to Life Radio on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400. Right to Life Radio with John Girardi. Being played in by the man in black, Johnny Cash. With a boy named Sue, a favorite of the Girardi girls, uh, a boy named Sue. Uh, we've been playing the, I've been playing on the guitar the, the entirety of a boy named Sue for the girls, uh, which takes several minutes at a time to do. Um, and now the girls are walking around saying, "Mama, what's an empty bottle of booze?" and etc. And other questions like that. So, right to life radio, your family friendly show for the best bump radio bumper music in the greater Fresno area radio market, and some say the world. All right. I have in my hands... Just doing a little Rush Limbaugh impression there. I have in my never nicotine-stained fingers an article from the New England Journal of Medicine, the most crazed pro-choice newspaper in the country, or journal or whatever, publication in the country. Uh, You may be saying, wait... The New England Journal of Medicine? You, don't you mean the New York Times is the most uh, abortion-crazed publication in the country? Or the Washington Post or something? No, 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 no. The New England Journal of Medicine, the most popular medical journal in the country, is the craziest, most left-wing, most pro-abortion journal of public opinion in the United States of America. They don't even consider the idea that abortion might not be something other than a totally acceptable medical practice. And they publish all kinds of wacky perspectives. This is a perspective piece. So it's an op-ed, basically. So it's not the position of the New England Journal of Medicine. But it is funny how the kinds of opinions that the New England Journal of Medicine gets around to publishing all sort of trend in the same direction. So this is a piece called Population, by the way, and this, this piece is brought to you by the shadow, one of the two shadow producers of the show, my mom, Dr. Sharon Girardi. Thanks, mom. The title of this piece is Population and the Environment, Time for Another Contraception Revolution Ugh. by Dr. Deborah J. Anderson. Oy vey. Now, we've been talking about this concept that there are too many people on the earth, so we need to have radical programs of population control and reduction We've been talking about stuff like this since Thomas Malthus, uh, after whom the adjective Malthusian came from. Thomas Malthus was like a big, I think, 19th century promoter of contraception and uh, eugenics, really, in a lot of ways. Um, people have been ringing this alarm bell that there's not enough, there's not enough, enough space in the world to, uh, not enough space in the world, not enough farming in the world to to provide for all these people who are being born. Oh, no, we need massive population control restrictions. There's a population bomb. Population bomb. Very soon, it, it, there's there's going to be an exponential 
increase in population and only a uh, additional increase in agriculture mm -hmm. and people are going to starve. You're going to have millions of people competing for scarce resources. John. Right. Now, this is ironic coming at a point where there are now fewer people starving on planet Earth thanks to all kinds of great scientific and uh, mechanical developments in farming where for, now America can literally feed the world. W well, and for those of you who are not familiar with Malthus, just just think of him as the 19th century Thanos. Yeah, so he would snap his finger. He, right. If he could, he would just snap his fingers yeah. and, and he, everyone would uh, and, and, disappear. And it's actually very funny because I, I saw a lot of very hilarious think pieces that came out. I'm ignoring the fact that you've you've sullied this show with another Infinity freaking War, Marvel, Marvel, Marvel reference. reference. Anyway, no, but, 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 but go but ahead. A lot of pro-life pro people said, humorously, they said, you know, um, if only someone would have come to Thanos and shown him that Malthusian ethics have been proven inaccurate. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. What? Who's the real bad guy? Yes, <laughs> was it Thanos or that pesky Captain America um, who um, tried to why, beat him? Why didn't Thanos just snap his fingers and double all the resources instead of killing half the people? Yeah. Um, um excuse me. There's a, a glaring hole in the logic of this universe where people fly around with magical hammers. Okay. <laughs> the real. Uh, anyway, whatever. I can go on my rant about Marvel movies and effectively all non-John Wick forms of modern popular entertainment. I realize the fact that I like John Wick, but I hate like all other movies is... I, I just, uh, it's controversial and hypocritical. It, it, it's not controversial. It's just flat-out hypocritical. I, I but just, I, just look I love forward, John Wick. I look forward to... I love John, John Wick. I look forward to taking you to the Marvel movie. I will pay for your ticket when John Wick finally comes to the Marvel Universe. Or not John uh, Wick, Keanu Reeves. When Keanu Reeves finally makes his Marvel Universe debut, I will I will buy your ticket gosh, for opening night. I really love Keanu Reeves. <laughs> it's going to be a tough one. All right. All right. So, anyway, this, art, this column from the New England Journal of Medicine is basically reiterating this same argument, that there are too many people that... Uh, and she's looking at this, this Dr. Deborah Anderson, who wrote this, or, uh, yeah, a doctor, well, she's a PhD, not an MD. Um, she wrote this piece basically saying, hey, um, the environmental changes that are happening, climate change, eventually stuff is going to happen with climate change that is going to result in massive problems that we're not going to be able to take care of all of the people on the earth. So she cites a bunch of different statistics. So the United Nations predicts that the human population will reach 9 billion by 2050 and probably 11.2 billion by the end of the century. Estimates of the number of human beings the earth can support range from fewer than 2 billion. By the way, there are 7 billion people on earth right now, so clearly that number's not doing so hot. To more than 100 billion. Oof. The median estimate is 8 billion. Uh, so if if the estimates are varying so wildly, like maybe we shouldn't have a massive program of, you know, telling people they can't have kids. Anyway, the actual number depends on variables such as acres of arable land, which there are gazillions of acres of arable land, amount of fresh water and human dietary habits. If the sustainability of ecosystem health and biodiversity are factored into the equation, modern estimates of the planet's carrying capacity become much lower. 1.5 billion to 5 billion people and have already been exceeded. Meanwhile, let's let's again reiterate this, that there are fewer people in extreme poverty and ex facing extreme hunger in the world than has uh, than has existed. I mean, there have been dramatic changes and improvements in country in continents like Africa, uh, Asia, where there's a much smaller percentage of people who are facing dire hunger than there were 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. Um, you can thank. To some extent, there you can thank capitalism to to a certain extent, markets and technology that have been developed. Uh, but there are far fewer people who are starving to death now than have been in decades. Uh, you know, you give credit to capitalism, or you, I, I don't. I don't purport to know all the answers for why. But the there this alarm bell is being rung at precisely the wrong time. <sighs> She goes on to say, population watchers. Boy, how do I get that job? That seems easy. <laughs> hmm. Well, yeah, it looks like a lot more people. Hmm. Here's a census report from another country. There's population in them there hills. Yeah, geez. 
Population watchers report that of the approximately 210 million human pregnancies that occur each year worldwide, at least 40%, more than 80 million, are unintended. Of these, about 30 million end in abortion or miscarriage, whew, and 50 million result in unplanned live births. Notably, the rates of unintended pregnancies are higher in both low-income countries and lo are higher in both high-income countries and low-income countries. Uh, what the heck does that mean? Okay. Um, a disproportionate number of unintended pregnancies occur in young, unmarried women who often lack access to comprehensive sexuality, education, and modern contraception. Do they? The time seems ripe for another contraception revolution to provide options for the diverse populations that are not currently being served by modern contraception. Let's translate this. You know all these poor, dumb African women who keep having too many freaking kids? Let's throw a bunch of condoms at them. They've certainly never heard of a condom. It certainly hasn't been 40 years of the United Nations practically airdropping condoms on the entire continent of Africa. Certainly they have no idea. They don't know what that condom does. So we got to teach these poor, stupid Africans a thing or two about how to not keep having babies. Sounds vaguely racist to me, John. I mean, you know... It's just kind of behind the scenes here seems to be what they're getting at. These people in, quote, developing countries, non-white, you know, Europeans and North Americans who keep having all these stinking kids and people in Muslim countries keep having all these stinking kids. I'm just saying you scratch a population control activist. Eventually you'll find someone who's maybe a little bit, a little bit racist about uh, third world or developing country attitudes as it relates to procreation. We're going to dig into this a little bit more after the break. You're listening to Right to Life Radio on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400. George Strait singing Amarillo by morning. On Right to Life Radio. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Right to Life Radio, a production, as always, of Right to Life of Central California, rtlcc.org. We'll have a new website launching next week, so stay tuned for that. It's going to be super duper slick. All right. I've been talking about this article from the, this column from the New England Journal of Medicine, basically saying that because of climate change, because of climate change, the earth is not going to be able to sustain its growing population. This is happening at the same time as American birth rates have gotten to the point where we are getting below replacement level for birth rates. And let me tell you something. <sighs> there are a lot of very left-wing, there are a lot of liberal people, left-wing people, who are in favor of both a very expansive social welfare state and population control promotion of abortion, et cetera, and who are okay with below population level birth rates. Well, guess what? You can't have both, okay? If you're going to have a social welfare, welfare system, the ideal way of doing it is to have a lot of workers and a lot of taxpayers supporting a few retirees and old people, a lot of people paying into the system and fewer people benefiting and receiving the benefits from the system, or at the very least, a pillar, about roughly the same number of people paying in as are taking out. Uh, if you have an inverted pyramid, that's not going to work. Okay, so uh, you can talk all you want about population control, but guess what? Europe is going to be facing a lot of tough challenges soon. All right, you've already seen countries like Greece, Spain, uh, Ir I think Ireland for a, for a brief moment there, uh, Portugal, who are facing these drastic, you know, budgetary problems because. They have very expansive social welfare states, and they don't have enough people. They've been contracepting themselves and aborting themselves into oblivion. So uh, I think the concerns in the New England Journal of Medicine about population control are rather mistimed. But we found another opinion piece from the New York Times by opinion columnist Farhad Manju, uh, which is pretty disturbing and is probably going to be the way in which some of these population control goals will be reached. And it relates to some stuff going on in California. So I thought I'd read from this. So again, this is a, an opinion piece from August 3rd in the New York Times. Again, written by Farhad Manju, an opinion columnist. Abortion pills should be everywhere. 
I bought them online. They're easy to get, and they'll change everything. Farhad Manju, by the way, is a guy, so I don't know what he was doing buying abortion pills. Anyway, one afternoon about a year ago, just as the Senate began considering Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court, I logged on to Day Night Healthcare, an online pharmacy based in India, and ordered a pack of abortion pills. A few hours later, I got a call from a day-night customer service agent with a warning. If my credit card company called to ask about the purchase, quote, tell them you approve the charge, but don't say what it's for, the man advised. If they ask, say it's gym equipment or something like that. Oh, that doesn't sound sleazy. In fact, the bank never called, and in a week and a half, a small brown envelope bearing a postmark not from India, but from New Jersey, arrived in the mail. Inside was a foil blister pack stamped with a manufacturer's logo, dosage information, and batch identification numbers. It contained five pills. One was a 200 milligram dose of mifepristone, better known by its code name during its development in the 1980s, RU486. The four others were 200 micrograms each of misoprostol, a drug used widely in obstetrics and gynecology, including to induce contractions. The pills looked unremarkable, tiny white round. They did not portray what some abortion rights activists say are their epic possibilities. Mifepristone was approved for use by the Food and Drug Administration nearly 20 years ago. By the way, folks, uh, who was it who approved uh, the FDA? Who uh, fast track under whose approval? under whose FDA uh, Pristone was approved? That would be Bill William Jefferson Clinton. Which literally, John, I, I remember going and one of the, the the very first time I went to Washington D.C. was 2001 for the March for Life uh, and the inauguration of President George W. Bush. But before the inauguration, the first full day we were in D.C., we went and did a sit-in. Slash protest where several people uh, in peaceful nonviolent protests got arrested. I was not one of them, mm -hmm. but it was. It's very common in D.C. to do these, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, protest arrests. But where did we do this protest arrest? In front of the Food and Drug Administration to protest the fact that in the waning months of the Clinton administration, the FDA had fast tracked and rushed approval mm -hmm. because they were worried that they were worried that George W. Bush would probably halt it. Yep. Yep. And uh, so there you go. Goes to show elections matter, folks. The drugs, uh, Farhad Manju uh, writes, the drugs, which have been used by tens of millions of women around the world, are also some of the safest known to modern medicine. Mifepristone has accumulated a record of adverse complications lower than that of Tylenol, Flonase, Xanax, and Viagra. Again, this th there is this narrative. Oh, my gosh. All right. So we're talking about medication abortion or chemical abortion. The California legislature right now is trying to pass a law, SB 24, which we've talked about a million times, where they would require that the student health centers at every CSU and UC provide medication abortion right there on campus. This language, that mifepristone has fewer adverse react complications to it than Tylenol, is so misleading and is such nonsense the side effects of Tylenol are constipation or nausea. The complications from Mifepristone are hemorrhaging, infection, and 24 women have died from it. Okay? So, and extreme pain and extreme cramping. So, stop. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm yelling at right to life radio listeners so that's probably the wrong people to yell at but it is so absurdly evil don't let liberals who talk about medication abortion get away with this no mifepristone is not safer than tylenol it does not it's it's it has fewer adverse complications okay i'd rather you know have mild nausea three times than hemorrhage and have extreme pain once okay that that's what we're talking about here all right in 2017 he goes on Canadian regulators lifted most restrictions on the drug, allowing it to be prescribed by any doctor without requiring an ultrasound and dispensed in any pharmacy. Oh, great. So you can have a, you can have a, the later along in pregnancy you are, the more complications you are. That's why the FDA limits it to eight to 10 weeks of pregnancy right now. Oh, so you just take a medication abortion at 14 weeks of pregnancy and maybe you'll have a horrible, you know, cramping and bleeding and maybe you'll get an infection like that. The, the callousness they have about any kind of health and safety restrictions around abortion is, is just, it's unbelievable. But in the United States, the FDA has imposed severe limits on mifepristone's distribution. It can be prescribed only by doctors who meet certain qualifications and can be dispensed only in clinics licensed to provide abortions, not retail pharmacies. Or, very soon, 
at student health centers at CSUs and UCs. So this is just another salvo in what what the pro-choice left wants. Okay, they want to deregulate medication abortion even further. Basically, they want people to be able to take it without having to go to a doctor. They want people to be able to basically be able to take it without having to get an ultrasound. Here's the future they want, and it jives with what we were talking about in an earlier segment, that the pro-choice left today wants abortion to be safe, legal, and universally accessible. Here's the way to make it universally accessible. You get rid of all of the health and safety regulations, all the regulation that exists around medication abortion. You have telemedicine services with Planned Parenthood. So you never have to leave your house. You whip out, you get a positive pregnancy test, you whip out your smartphone, you're chatting online with a Planned Parenthood nurse practitioner who can give you a prescription for medication abortion over your phone via a chat-based app. You can get a prescription for medication abortion over your phone and what now, right now, you have to go to a clinic to get that medication abortion. What they want, the future that Farhad Manju, this opinion columnist from the New York Times, is envisioning, what these population control activist types are envisioning, is that you would get your prescription over the phone and then you'd have medication abortion mailed to your house via an, an Amazon Prime-esque you know, method of modern capitalist efficiency. That's what they want. This makes abortion genuinely universally accessible. And for your government-funded health insurance plan to pay for the whole thing on the taxpayer's dime. So it doesn't cost you anything. You don't even have to leave your room. It is literally delivered right to your door. And maybe it'll be delivered by a drone, just as, just as long as we're getting into the you know dystopian 1984 uh, you know, feel of this. That is the future. Of medica- that is the future of abortion in this country, unless we take steps right now to stop it, unless we take steps to pass laws to restrict it. When we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I don't know, Jonathan, maybe I should burn all of the goodwill I've engendered and talk about something controversial as it relates to the shootings Oh boy! Uh, over this past week that we saw in Ohio and in Texas. You're listening to Right to Life Radio on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400. Right to Life Radio, Power Talk, 96.7-8-1400. Brooks and Dunn, everybody. What's with the country kick today? Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, Sophie Girardi, my daughter, requested a boy named Sue, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to play some country music this week on Right to Life Radio. So, thank you so much for tuning in. All right. I'm going to talk about the shootings that happened this past weekend. I'm going to tread lightly um, because it, it, it runs into something that I, um, I'm not even sure what's the best way to do it, but this is something that I think pro-life activists of various sorts have encountered a lot. The phrase, you're not truly pro-life unless, and then someone brings up some topic that doesn't directly deal with abortion or assisted suicide or something like that. Now, on this show, uh, this is a show produced by Right to Life of Central California, and Right to Life of Central California is an organization that was formed and is, is listed in our bylaws the issues about which we are active. We are not all things to all people. We are an organization that was founded to talk about certain issues regarding the sanctity of human life, as it relates to certain questions, abortion, physician-assisted suicide, embryo-destructive stem cell research, etc. Okay, um, we are so basically what we focus on as my particular organization, and I think more broadly with the pro-life movement in general, with with some disagreements, are issues that involve the taking the legal taking of innocent human life. That is what we deal with. So legalized physician-assisted suicide, it is the legal taking of an innocent human life. Abortion is the legal taking of an innocent human life. For this reason, the death penalty is kind of a separate issue because it is the legal taking of someone who is not 
an innocent person. This is someone who has been judged guilty by the due process of the American criminal justice system to have committed some capital offense. Now, this is not to say I'm like pro death penalty and I'm I'm ready to you know pull the lever and and you know uh, you know fry him up. No, far from it. No, I'm uh, neither myself personally nor Right to Life as an organization. Uh, right to Life as an organization is not like pro death penalty. Uh, it's just we were founded for certain things, and I think there were logical boundaries that were established within our organization with a lot of other pro-life organizations that this will be our area of focus there are other organizations that do work relating to the death penalty god bless them that's that's fine but we're not all things to all people and often i'm approached with this notion that unless you oppose the specific policies of child separation, uh, which policy is in place right now versus what was in place a few months ago at the border, or unless you support this policy of gun control, which lots of smart people on both sides of the aisle have debated about what effectiveness it would have in preventing things like the mass shootings that have taken place over the last two weeks, uh, unless you do X, Y, and Z pet liberal project, you pro-lifer John Girardi are a hypocrite. To which I say, well, no, I don't think I am. I think I have, I think that there is a, now, this is not to say one way or another how you should, what you should think about gun control. I think obviously people killing lots of people with guns is bad. Um, as I think every as person. every single person does. I think there are differences in among intelligent people about what is the best means to stop that. Uh, very few of the gun control measures that are being introduced, uh, for example, in Congress, would have had the effect of stopping the various shootings that happened. Um, in fact, there's a writer from 538, I can't remember her name, but she basically took the position of being not necessarily as much in favor of the gun control messages of many other people on the left because she looked at the data and found this is not really going to make much of an impact. Mm -hmm. And I think from a legal perspective as a lawyer, like uh, short of eviscerating the second amendment, I don't know that there's much that's going to happen unless you can in some really drastic way, reduce the total supply of guns that exist throughout the country. Uh, I don't know how you're really going to make a huge dent in gun crimes. I, I also noticed for the first time ever, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Ah, yes. N not uh, Degrassi. Degrassi. Degrassi is yeah, the... Sorry, uh, that's the TV show from yes. Canada that J Drake was in. Yes. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who has said so many stupid things. for Pretty remarkable for a guy who's a PhD in astrophysics or whatever the heck he is. Um, who has said so many stupid things that uh, no liberal has ever given him crat crud about because he generally seems to support very left-wing policies. Neil deGrasse Tyson pointed out, like, yes... Mass shootings are really bad, but they're a minuscule percentage of the number of people who, you know, die accidentally in car crashes and a minuscule percentage of the people who die through n more pedestrian, you know, non-mass shootings, normal gun violence that's happening every weekend in urban, in various urban settings throughout our country, uh, handgun violence, if you will. Um, it, it's just that, you know, when a teenager gets shot by a handgun in Chicago, it doesn't become a national news story. And let me let me read, John, because I, I was hoping you might bring that up. He said, in the past 48 hours, the USA has horrifically lost 34 people to mass shootings. On average, across any 48 hours, we also lose 500 to medical errors, 300 to the flu, 250 to suicide, 200 to car accidents, 40 to homicide via handgun. So in any 48-hour stretch, you're going to lose more people through normal handgun homicides than you are through this ma these two back-to-back -back mass right. shootings. I'd also note, by the way, uh, not to bring everything back to abortion, but there are more late-term abortions, so 20 weeks onward in pregnancy. There are more late-term abortions that happen every year in this country than all deaths via handgun combined. And I'll also note, you know, Every single day in America, there are more abortions. There are you know thousands of abortions that take place. Yeah. So I, 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 now, does this mean we can't walk and chew gum at the same time? No. Does that mean people engaging in mass shootings should be ignored and we shouldn't work towards better public policy to do that? No. I don't think though that just because you fail 
to support a certain party's proposed solution to mass shooter violence that you are therefore not pro-life or because you don't support, you know, a certain, you know, one or another prudential position as it relates to immigration stuff. Obviously no one wants kids to be separated from children. I think, you know, I, you know, but you know, the various individual policies that were introduced at the border there, there's all kinds of different factors going into it. Needless to say, I think we have a culture where everyone is assuming that anyone who disagrees with their political position on things like gun control, on things like immigration, is a heartless, cruel monster who should just be, you know, yelled out of the room. And I just don't think that's the case. And, you know, we need to care about all these things, but I think it's perfectly reasonable for me to be pro-life and not be an activist for every issue under the sun. I don't even know if that all made sense, but this is something that just annoys me, the way that people say, you're not really pro-life. All right. I hope I'm really pro-life, at least enough for you, my dear audience. You've been listening to Right to Life Radio on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400.